officially recording and live as blast off is in five dial up dial up I, I did just get two little pop-ups on my screen saying live and i assume that's recording it's live and recording mr addison mo my brother from another well thank you for joining me today on the building bellingham pivot series um where are you right now what are you up to i'm down in camas washington in my office working today but actually talking to you so that's what i'm doing at the moment awesome so obviously the banking and finance industry the financial sector has not been affected obviously uh, from an essential working standpoint so you're still able to go to work you're still keeping that whole thing chugging down there um, but tell me a little bit more about yourself you don't originally hail from camas washington you're from up in this area right correct correct so i am i consider myself to be from bellingham which might be controversial because i didn't actually move to bellingham until high school but uh bellingham's home for me so my family's still up there i actually have family all across the west coast but bellingham is home to me and so i've been down here in camas which is close to portland oregon for about six years now yeah six years yeah so been that's how i ended up down in. here yeah i've been trying you know it's been shameless i've been trying to get you to come back up here to come home and uh and hang out with us up here but actually um for those of you that um watched the healthcare professional episode addison's mother lise wa was on that episode so We've got uh, familiar faces coming back here and uh, passing along the, the gauntlet on the Building Bellingham podcast here. So thank there you for joining us. There you go. Yeah, tell, tell us a little bit more about what you do, who you are, what, uh, what, what your world has been like recently. Yeah, yeah. So I am a financial planner. Uh, I uh, help people figure out, identify, prioritize, and uh, accomplish their financial goals, whatever they might be. You had uh, made a statement earlier that seems like my industry and banking and financial services is still chugging along. We are essential, but it is interesting how different places have adapted to what's going on right now. So my team, we're a small team with a small office, only four of us. So we are still coming into our office, but kind of keeping our space. A lot of the industry has transitioned, I think, to working remote, but we all decided in our group that uh, it probably makes the most sense for us to keep coming in. We're not as productive at home and all of our meetings are virtual now, kind of like this uh, or on the phone, but we're still coming in uh, and it's been really nice having a sense of normalcy and routine built into everything going on still coming into the office i think is keeping me sane and helping keep my wife sane too i can only imagine if we were both at home constantly what what that would be like so it's been yeah. nice coming in yeah so you're talking about for you your role is i mean so much of what recently happened was health related right but but the economic the ripple economically after that I mean, we can dive into that as, as much or as little as you'd like to, but I think mm -hmm. for, for the people that are watching, um, you know, maybe they have stocks or they have a 401k or they have all of these things they're banking on down the road or um, are banking on in the near future. Um, what has been your experience with your clients? Maybe obviously you don't have to share specific examples, but what are, mm -hmm. what are some experiences that you're seeing? How are you guiding people? What are your like, what are you seeing into the future? Like what, what, what's happening? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like you said, this was a, it's been fascinating seeing what's happened this year and the impact on people's lives around the world. So going into 2020, the economy was actually doing pretty well. It was in a strong position. And then we had this external shock of coronavirus that has kind of rocked things to their core. And it has impacted everyone because uh, whether it's somebody's job that has been impacted or their portfolio or their retirement savings or their kids college savings, they've all been influenced and impacted by what's going on. 
for our clients, it's interesting because we work with people across the board. We, we work with the young families that are just trying to figure out how do we pay off student loans while saving for our first house to the clients that have been retired for 15, 20 years. So we have conversations that are across the full spectrum. And when I think about our clients and who I work with on a daily basis, there's two camps really. Uh, one camp of clients is more or less, uh, they're a little nervous, they want reassurance, but they think they'll make it through. They just want to better understand how they're impacted. And then the other camp is, well, we know this isn't good and it kind of sucks, frankly, but how do I make the most out of it and take advantage of it? So it, it's been interesting having those conversations. And honestly, I've had two, maybe three panic phone calls over the last two months, but for the most part, it's been business as usual. We're having our ongoing meetings with clients. We meet with clients twice a year, if not more, depending on their situation. And uh, the conversations are really centered around, well, how's your family adjusting? Are you washing your hands? And well, here's how it's impacted you. Here's how we move forward. Yep. So that, that's a high level. Yeah, totally. So it's, it's so interesting because you have to sh shift your mindset and shift your conversation between somebody that's trying to figure out how to begin and then somebody that's at the point where they're like, how do I kind of coast on what I've, what I've built over time? So that must be really mm -hmm. interesting. And, and for you, your job is really, I mean, to say that you have a crystal ball is, is kind of a joke. You know, we kind of say, oh, what's, what's the crystal ball or what's the market, mm -hmm. this, that, or the other. But for you, what are, like, when you're handling somebody's wealth, what are some economic storm clouds that you see and how do you help people find opportunity in those, uh, in those moments? Yeah, what, what's important to us is whoever we're working with, making sure that whatever their strategy and plan is, is consistent and followed through when times are good and when times are bad. So uh, kind of a, a metaphor or analogy, think about your workout plan. You, you have certain goals for working out, exercising, and being healthy. To really be successful, you stick with those goals when you're feeling great, and you stick with those goals and your plan when you're not feeling great and sore and aching and don't want to go to the gym. It, financially, it's the same thing. Whatever your goal was six months ago, whether it was retiring 20 years from now or buying that house, you still have that goal, and the portfolio that we have structured should be built around that goal. So if somebody needs money over the next few years, Ideally, it shouldn't have been impacted by any of this because it shouldn't have been invested in a way that was hurt. If it's money that's not needed for 20, 30 years from now, then great, this is almost a buying opportunity. So just stay the course and keep putting money in. Uh, you're right, there is no crystal ball. Uh, different people might claim to know what's going to happen. But when we think about markets and their relationship with the economy, we have to remember that markets tend to be forward looking. What I mean by that is this week, last week, and over the next few weeks, we'll be getting all sorts of economic data for the first quarter of the year. That's gonna be pretty bad, but it's not gonna be a surprise to anyone. Back in February and early March, when we started thinking, oh, we might be shutting things down, the markets already responded to that information and took the big hits. So when Procter and Gamble or whoever tells us they sold a record amount of toilet paper over the last two months, no one's going to be surprised by that uh, because we've already known that was happening. When restaurants start telling us, oh, we lost a ton of business, no one's going to be surprised about that either. So what we want to do is make sure we're paying attention to things and making sure as soon as we start getting those glimmers of hope, that's when we think the markets will start to become more favorable and reverse and correct and recover. So bottom line, no one should be trying to time these things. They should just make sure that, again, whatever their strategy was six months ago, stick with it. Don't react. Yep. So that's, that's so key. Well, in any sort of uh, build investment, like building a business, investing in different uh, types of, maybe retirement accounts or stocks or whatever it is, what you're talking about is having that sense of like calmness 
and mm -hmm. reading these signs, but then not reacting too quickly because when you start reacting, you start kind of going down a, a spiral of reacting to what other people are doing, right? And what's happening, right? Versus being proactive or just being calm, right? Correct, absolutely. And oftentimes when things like this happen where portfolios take a hit, people want to feel like they have a sense of control. And oftentimes that control results in them making a change that might not be a rational thought out change. It might more be a, an emotional reaction that's based on feelings rather than, than logic and reasoning. And so it's important that if you are responding or making decisions, you're really confident you understand the why behind it rather than the, the gut reaction to it. Right. And that's where you step in and you say, look, I've, I've dealt with this before, or I've, we haven't dealt with anything like this, but we know what ripples these type of things have. We don't know how big it's going to be, but we know it's going to be a ripple. You touched on an awesome key phrase there. There's never been anything like this. We've never had a coronavirus pandemic before. Uh, but every time there's a recession, every time there's a market drop, it's always different. It's never been the same thing twice. Now, the impacts and the symptoms and the repercussions might feel similar. Uh, the economy might slow down. People might unfortunately lose their jobs. But it's never the same cause twice. Things are always different leading up to it. So instead of saying, well, it's different this time, we would rather people think, well, this too shall pass. Because we've had challenges in the past, and we always will in the future. And no one can predict them. But staying the course and getting through it is really the best way to handle all of this. Yeah. So, so would you say that, you know, well, based on what we're seeing, we're seeing lots, especially restaurants, a lot of restaurants shutting mm -hmm. down the service industry, the hospitality industry is hit pretty hard. Um, and, for, and including, you know, uh, you know, uh, Alaska airlines, United, all of the, uh, mm -hmm. travel industry. So, for, for as far as staying the course and staying forward and keep continuing to move forward, um, is this a time where obviously we respect the stay home, stay healthy, we stay distanced, we, we focus on the health aspect, but from an economic standpoint, like what are some things that we should be doing in your opinion? What can we be doing to make sure that the economy stays afloat outside of these stimulus packages and these, you know, these SBA loans? Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you, what, what's your recommendation? Yeah, it, well, the recommendation depends on who you are and how you've been impacted by things. Uh, there has been a lot of relatively fast response at the federal level to everything going on. Uh, you had brought up the, the different industries that have been impacted most significantly. Uh, but again, I, and I think I may have touched on it earlier, no one was surprised that these industries were going to be impacted. And that's why we saw so much aid directed at them. Uh, for on an individual level, what you should be doing, uh, again, if you're, if you're young and you're still working, keep saving, keep putting money into your 401k. If you're out of work because of everything going on, then make sure you're taking steps to take advantage or understand the resources available to you, whether it's unemployment or whether it's student loans being uh, temporarily suspended or whatever other programs you might qualify for. If you're a few years away from retirement, th those are the people that tend to be the most shaken by this, that the people that thought they were gonna retire in three or five years. For you, you should be looking at, well, how was your portfolio impacted and is it structured in a way that you are okay despite this? Do you have your portfolio built in a way where if you were retiring in five years, you still can do that because you had enough cash and bonds set aside or was everything in stocks and did it take a big hit? If you're in that case, then take this time to reassess your plan and talk to your planner or your advisor to make sure it's set up properly so you can get through it. And if you've been retired for five, 10, 15 years, I think you've probably seen enough of these cycles where you know we'll get through it. So just 
keep doing what you've been doing and for everyone, keep washing your hands and keep social distancing. Those are the, the best things to do. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's great advice. So, and, and, I, and I love that because you could easily say, well, this is what, and you, there's a lot of people out there and we know these people that teach courses and they say, this is the square hole that everyone should fit into. And what you're saying is like, well, there's, it all comes down to your situation. So if you have anybody out there that's telling you to do one thing fits all, you know, one size fits all, that's, that's mm -hmm. not the, that's not the solution. And, um, you know, I, it's funny because I think you've probably heard this too. Hey, Addison, have you heard of the Acorns app? Man, I've been throwing money into that Acorns app. What, uh, what is, I, I want this, and again, there's no crystal ball, but for people that are seeing this as an opportunity to buy stocks for companies that are hurting right now, mm -hmm. uh, what advice do you have for those people? Is this a huge economic opportunity from a, is this a buy opportunity or is this, is that just, what everybody's doing. Can you give us some more insight on, on, on that? I think a couple years down the road, we'll look back on this and say, oh, it probably was a good time to buy. What is tricky is people try to focus too much on what is the bottom. Is the bottom of the drop today? Is the bottom going to happen three months from now? Did the bottom happen two weeks ago and did I miss it? Uh, and the, the flaw with thinking about that is it kind of ignores the real long-term trends and cycles. And what we do know, and no one knows what's going to come down the road. No one, past performance cannot predict future results, anything like that. But we know, and the famous quote is, time in the market beats timing the market. So if you have the money and you're wanting to buy something, do it today. Because 30 years from now, it won't matter if you had bought it today or two weeks from now. It, it's, you, you have to zoom out and look at the big picture and the big trends and, and, and realize that timing doesn't really make sense. It's all about just sticking to it and be consistent. Absolutely. And that, and that comes You're right there. Yeah, go ahead. And I, I'd say there is no silver bullet. There is no one size fits all, like you said. Uh, it's about having the good habits and sticking with the good habits. Absolutely. And, and, and even the translation, I love that time in the market beats timing the market. I love that because, um, you know, my dad told me, uh, who is a real estate investor, he doesn't do as much stocks as he does real estate. And I said, dad, when I was before I got into real estate, I said, when, when's the best time to get into to the real estate market? He's like, Oh, uh, 30 years ago. And I was like, Oh dude, I don't want to hear that. But the truth is, time in the market is, is the key. And so for those of you that are watching this, that are, um, should I buy stock? Well, does it, is it, do you have the money? You know, cash reserves are really important. Wouldn't you agree right now, even more so than having money in the stock market? Uh, again, it depends on who you are. If, uh, if, if you are retired and you're living off your portfolio, you need to have cash no matter what to cover the next year or three years of distributions. If you're taking money out on a monthly basis, I never want a client to be in a position where they realize, well, shoot, stock markets are down. I have to sell stocks to continue making my mortgage payment or to keep getting groceries. I want that cash already set aside. But if you're somebody that's not relying on the portfolio for anything, then at the moment, then the cash component isn't as important. But I think everyone should have that cash reserve buffer that will help cover expenses, worst case scenario. So I, I think I, I went a different direction than you brought up, but the cash bucket is important for everyone, but it's a different sized bucket depending on who you are. So what I'm hearing is the key, if you're in a situation where you're trying to assess, should I have more cash? Should I be saving more money? Should I put money on a credit card? Should I buy stocks? Whatever it is. Um, that's a question that you should be consulting with a, with a professional that can help guide you and based on your, per, your specific situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Addison for you, um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about, and I know that you run your, your personal budget pretty tight, but um, you know, what, what is it like for somebody? What are some items that when people go through or what maybe give your, an example of your own personal financial situation where you, you saw these trends happening and you said, 
well, things are okay right now. I'm still essential. Here are some things that I can redline. Here are some kind of like in the middle items. How important is that, that, that staying lean mentality, whether you make 5000 or $3,000 a month or $50,000 a month, how important is that constant awareness of your budget and your bottom line? Uh, it, it depends on how you manage your finances. There are some people that track everything to the penny. And there are some people that say, well, as long as my savings is happening, I can more or less continue to spend whatever else is left over as long as I'm saving before I do that. And I somewhat ironically, I'm a financial planner. I fall into that second camp where I make sure whenever I have money coming in, a chunk of that is set aside. Uh, for the long-term goals and the more short-term goals and then everything else well if we spend it or we save it great we'll we'll do whatever happens so however you best plan your finances on an ongoing basis just continue sticking with it what has been interesting seeing the big changes uh, from coronavirus is I know that uh, like everyone out there we're not spending money eating out we're going to bars or traveling right now so in theory, uh, a lot of people, if you're still working, should have a lot of extra room to save at the moment. Uh, and everyone, again, is in a different position, but that's just been an interesting observation for me personally, that we're, we're saving a lot of money by not eating out, uh, but we're still eating really well. We're just cooking at home more, you know? Yeah, absolutely. More time at home. And granted, there are amazing services. Like you just told me about a spot is it down in Vancouver that's doing mobile beer delivery. Yeah, yeah. It is just one of the breweries we, we frequent. We actually had our um, rehearsal dinner there before our wedding. They just posted on Facebook. They have, they're doing ice cream truck style beer deliveries where they're driving through the neighborhoods to sell uh, cans, it looks like. So that's interesting. Pretty cool. <laughs> It really, really hits home and brings tears to my eyes. It, you know, maybe this is the pivot point that we needed for, um, you know, margarita deliveries and, and beer trucks going around the neighborhood. But we'll, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll see what the the long term impacts and changes are to society as a result. Yeah, hopefully not more alcoholism. Um, <laughs> but I did want to dive into because you because for those watching, um, Addison does he is our financial planner for me and my wife and one of the pieces that he had reached out to me about was um, the SBA loans, disaster relief loans, and the PPP loans. Addison, can you, for the business owners that are out there watching this, and the people that haven't taken advantage of those, can you explain a little bit more about those, those programs and when they're the right fit and how to, like, what to do, what, what, they, what they're for, really? Yeah, uh, so the, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, actually, it, that's been a fascinating thing to watch because late in March, the CARES Act was passed uh, the last week of March. And Congress more or less said uh, the SBA has to start taking applications within a week, but, or b banks had to take applications within a week. Uh, but then the rules for the loans didn't have to be finalized by the SBA until two weeks. So the, the banks had to be accepting applications prior to all of the rules being finalized. That was on the PPP. Uh, at, at initially, there was, about, there, there was a chunk of money set aside by Congress for businesses and employers that needed help paying their employees. It was a set amount of funds that has already been depleted. So if you did not apply and already receive your PPP proceeds, then at this point, there might not be more money in the bucket. However, Congress has talked about wanting to add funding, so we'll see what happens. The PPP was all through local lenders. The EIDL, the Economic Impact Disaster Loan, that's a loan that's been around for a long time and that's through the SBA directly to help businesses. Uh, the difference between the two is the EIDL is just a loan that has some grant money offered in it. The PPP loan is a loan that offers potential forgiveness on uh, a pretty big chunk of whatever the loan amount is if you keep employing and paying your employees. 
So those at a high level are the differences, uh, but the benefits of the two depend on your business size, your business structure, what you do and how many employees you have. Yeah, so when, when you called me, we can use me as a specific example, you said, have you applied for your PPP loan? And I said, yep, we've applied for it. Um, and you explained to me that, obviously I don't wanna get into all the guidelines of what it, what it actually covers, but the way that you, in layman's terms, because you always have to use layman's terms with me, you, 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 you came to me and said, look, you need to apply for the PPP loan because it will cover your, your payroll for two months plus 25%. Is that about right? So it's roughly two and a half months of, of salary. Is that ballpark? At a high level, yeah. Okay. So yeah, and, and not to get too into that, but it's, that was an opportunity for us to say, well, that's the right loan. And for the EIDL uh, that we also applied for, it's still a very low interest loan for, for business owners out there that are wondering what that is. It's, it is, there is a grant, but beyond that, if you take more money or you request more money or, or approve for more money, does it then become a pretty low interest bearing uh, loan? Yeah, and part of the issue with all of these changes that have happened, uh, and the CARES Act, again, end of March, that's when it passed Congress and was signed into law. Because things were moving so quickly to help stimulate the economy, to get money directly to consumers and businesses, there was a lot of misinformation about the two programs. And so very quickly with the EIDL, the Economic Impact Disaster Loan, uh, people started talking about, well, whatever your loan is, there's a $10,000 grant that you don't have to repay. The specific language was up to $10,000 grants, but that wasn't really talked about. So there were a lot of people thinking no matter what loan size you took out for the EIDL, you would get $10,000 for free. There's still not really been clarity on the formula uh, and how it's decided, but what the language means is it could have been a $500 grant that you never had to pay back, or it could have been a 10,000 grant, or anything in between. Mm -hmm. And because there wasn't clarity there, the PPP loan made a sense, or the PPP program made a lot of sense for a lot of people, because it seemed likely that there would be more forgiveness. Uh, but for every business out there, there were a lot of other things to consider, a lot of other benefits or other programs to participate in for you as a, uh, as a employer, but as a, who has 1099 employees, it made sense for you and your employees to take the PPP route for potential more forgiveness to help sustain your business through everything that's going on. Yep, absolutely appreciate that. And and just to explain the, the specific structure of how our business works and why it was unique um, is because technically I am a W-2 employee of my own company. So we don't need to dive into tax path pass-throughs and, and, and LLCs and whatnot. But long, the, the sh long story short, I am an, a W-2 employee of my own company. But that being said, our um, our admin staff are all 1099 contractors. So they actually have to apply on their own behalf as a contractor for the PPP loan. Is that correct? That is correct. And with all of this, it's another perfect example of there's no one size fits all. <laughs> and in your case, that made sense to pursue. For other businesses, it may have or it may not have, depending on their specific dynamics. Yeah. So it's important that, again, this is all coming back to the relevance of why what Addison does and why other financial planners, what they're doing, it, it, you know, I think there's a lot of like fog. People don't necessarily understand what you do, but when you, when you break it down, it's, it's a, a consultant to help take every size and fitting it in the right hole. Right. So I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad. Cause I think that's what you do, <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually we had uh, so Max Alt just commented here, had a question and I, if you don't mind, I'm going to share a, a live comment or a live question. Oh, um, all right. He's asking, should we be consolidating some retirement accounts and do bond funds given interest rates and the Fed announcement around massive bond purchases? It's a very technical question that I would say still comes back to who you are 
and it depends on your retirement plan and what specific bond funds they offer within the plan. What's interesting is uh, with all of the headlines about interest rates being extremely low, uh, why would you ever hold bonds? And looking at the last, well, this year so far, it was a perfect example of why bonds do make sense. Bonds provide stability and act as a buffer for a portfolio. When we think about at a very high level investments, you have stocks, which is ownership in companies, and you have bonds, which are loans to businesses and governments. So at, at a very high level, when we think about cash, cash is very stable and it doesn't grow. We have bonds that are relatively stable. They go up and down a little bit. And then we have stocks that go up and down a lot over time. We know that stocks provide the most long-term growth potential, but the greatest risk generally. Uh, and that's all from historic data. Bonds offer more stability because you're not taking the ownership risk. You are, again, loaning money to governments or companies. Uh, so with interest rates being very low, what that means is if I'm an investor and I have bonds in my portfolio, I'm going to continue receiving interest payments from that company and then my money back that I initially loaned at some point in the future. As interest rates have gone down, the direct income from bonds projecting forward in theory have also gone down. So the earning potential, if you were to get a bond today and hold it until it matures in the future is much lower than a bond from the 80s when interest rates were at record highs. So the general thought is why would you own a bond? And the answer is because they're safer than stocks. And if we look at year to date, the S&P 500, the broader stock market uh, at its low point was down maybe call it 28% this year, down 28 something. Long-term treasuries, so US government bonds, the safest bond out there, they were up 20% in value because every time things get rocky, people sell their stocks and either keep it in cash or buy bonds with it. And that's where if we're thinking about your retirement portfolio, you do wanna have some bonds, you do want to make sure that you have that buffer because it's not all about the future interest income from bonds. It's about that stability factor and safety when times get tough. Some 401ks offer a ton of bond options. Some 401ks offer uh, very generic bond options that more or less look at the entire bond market. So for Max's question, it really comes down to what his plan offers. Uh, and that's one of those questions that depends on your situation. So are you advising Max to contact you directly? I'm advising Max to, to talk to his advisor and make sure that whatever he is invested in still makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And yeah. let's, let's talk a little bit more about the real estate market. What, and I know that that's kind of my world, but also I know that that's heavily tied to what you do. Um, tell me uh -huh. a little What's that? Yeah, I said, uh-huh. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh, sure. I was just responding to, to you, active listening. Active listening, teach me, teach me active listening. Um, but yeah, so with clients that are, you know, feeling in, unstable about the real estate market and about how that, mm -hmm. how it's going to be impacted financially as a result or a byproduct of what's going on in the, the stock world, um, what what is what is your what are your thoughts on on the real estate market and is it volatile right now is it a perfect storm with low interest rates and low inventory what do you what do you think very good question and very much your wheelhouse question uh i guess it depends on real estate that from working with our clients i i know that there are those that have had a lot of success with real estate and they think why would I ever do anything but real estate and there are those that have had tenant issues or whatever other repair problems and never would touch real estate again rarely do I see people in the middle where they're like oh I like real estate and I, I think I'll go and do some more 
uh, as far as what we're seeing for real estate, that it's a very specific question tied to where you are, the region you are, and is it a house that you plan on living in or is it a house that you view or a property you view as an investment? And those would really drive our views on things. Uh, I think one of your, your points was, well, interest rates are super low. So it's probably from a mortgage and financing world uh, view, a good time to buy. But I have no way of knowing what will happen with the real estate market. And I don't think anyone really knows, uh, but you might have a different view on that. Yeah. I, I love how you spun that back to me. Yeah. No, but it's, it's totally, it's spot on because there there's variables, you know, you don't have to physically meet people to do your job. And part of real estate is residential real estate at least is about the feeling because home is a, is a feeling, right? It's your foundation for your life. It's how it, it sets you up for success in other ways. So to answer that question, you know, I, yeah, I, it, it totally is location based. Nobody knows what the future is like. All we know is what we can analyze today. And every day is day mm -hmm. by day, really, where, where rules are changed. At first, we weren't essential. Now we are essential. So it, it just really comes down to what your needs are. Again, the same thing you keep saying, it, it depends on that specific person's needs. It depends on that specific market they want to be in. It depends on so many different factors. So um, but we do know right now, low interest rates, low inventory, actually lower inventory than we've seen historically. It's been at three months in Bellingham specifically. Three months inventory, meaning if no other homes came on the market, everything sold. It would take about three months ba based on the days on market. And now it's at 2.4. So lower inventory, which means good time to sell, potentially. So yeah, no. So Addison, um, so tell me about some silver linings. Like, I mean... You're a positive person. You're one of my best friends. You see, always see the positive in things, but you also, part of your job is being realistic. Tell me a little bit more about some personal silver linings you found. Um, it doesn't have to just be about your, your career and some mm -hmm. for your career. Maybe share some of uh, those silver linings as well. Yeah, definitely. Personal side, the, for the last two months, life has seen some very interesting changes that I think a lot of people will agree with have impacted them dramatically. But for me, uh, coming into the office does, again, provide a sense of normalcy and routine, which has been really nice. What I've really enjoyed seeing, not that things are good, not that I'm happy with the current coronavirus situation and shelter in place and anything like that, but where we live, the sense of community has definitely seemed a lot stronger recently and community while being socially distant, I'll add, but uh, neighbors offering to help neighbors. You hear about that all the time. You hear about people wanting, people that are able to wanting to continue supporting local businesses. Uh, it, it's been really cool seeing how people, again, have come together over the, the last month or so and come up with creative ways to make sure everyone's doing okay. Uh, I know that our local school districts, as soon as school was stopped, uh, the bus drivers started delivering lunches to students that needed the lunches from school. And things like that, you kind of see little stories everywhere. Uh, so I think oftentimes you don't hear about the good stuff as much, but there's definitely good stuff going on. Uh, other silver linings. Uh, my wife and I have been going on tons of walks lately, which has been really cool seeing more of the neighborhood. The weather's been great. Uh, so overall, you know, as weird as life has been, uh, it's been nice seeing some of the impacts. Yeah. So, so you've been spending some more time um, together. You've been seeing more of a sense of community, um, which is great. People supporting their local businesses, you cooking from home, you guys spending more time walking, doing the things. Do you, do you feel like it's kind of like a regrounding reset moment for us? Absolutely. It almost makes it seem like when, when everyone gets caught up in life and the whirlwind of being busy, of working or going to school, oftentimes I, I think a lot of the important stuff hits the sidelines, if you will. And it's been a really good way to really reconnect with, uh, I think, each other, but also the things that we enjoy doing and prioritize them more. What I have missed a lot is 
hanging out with friends. We've tried to take social distancing pretty seriously and it's probably been over a month or so since we've seen most of our friends. So that's been, I think, a challenge. Uh, I think, uh, I say this almost tongue in cheek, uh, a challenge for us has been, uh, well, this weekend, I'm probably gonna trust Brina to cut my hair for the first time ever, because my hair is the longest it's been since middle school when I had a bowl cut. So that, that'll be interesting seeing how we, we get through the hair cutting process. Shout out to uh, Lise, Tony, and Dennis for allowing bowl cuts. And those, for those of you that are watching, those are, those are uh, Addison's parents and step parents. So, but yeah, no, so just being open to more things like that. What, what, are, what have been some, some things maybe personally and professionally that have been on your someday maybe list that are more of a on the business or on, on the Addison versus, you know, other way, so the someday maybe list or are you saying things that were on that list that are now happening or things that yeah, have been you, added to the yeah are you making some renovations at home are you learning how to cook maybe are you learning how to take out the trash like things like that we've had to reprioritize a lot of our plans uh with the house we were we have a very small kitchen and it's a very bad kitchen uh, and we were planning on ripping out the the three cabinets we have and replacing them uh, and making the kitchen overall nicer and more user friendly but we've had to put that completely on hold which means last weekend we spent a ton of time out in the, the yard weeding uh, doing yard work we put a shed up which wasn't really on our radar but has since become a, th a, a goal so that other projects can move forward in the future. So we've definitely reprioritized some things along the way. Yep. Uh, Brina just commented, and for those of you that are watching, Brina is Addison's wife, and uh, she said he is learning how to fold clothes. So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty monumental. We're all proud of you. That, that's true. And I would uh, respond with, she's learning how to do dishes, which oh, has been very nice. I have heard that Brina that was something just like folding clothes was, was a challenge for her as well. So um, before we wrap up, let's, I want to talk a little bit about routine because mm -hmm. you're definitely a person that follows routine. I'm a person that follows routine, uh, especially for our careers right now. What are some things that you're doing? Like what's a day in the life of you that allows you to like still feel like you're fully in the swing and, and things are still moving forward with some yeah, sort of so Yeah. So, so much of my work schedule is based on my meetings. So all of our clients are, uh, we have regularly scheduled reviews with them. Uh, and so we're still doing them. I still have my regular client meetings, but they're all either virtual like this or on the phone. So coming into the office, I, I still know what my day's more or less going to look like. At the same time, there. Uh, we use the phrase the whirlwind, and I know I'm, we're not the only people that do that, but the whirlwind is just the stuff that you can't foresee that comes up. And there's still definitely stuff coming up to get in the way of the, the business and the routine as far, and the challenges are different and unique. Uh, I think recently, some of the new challenges have been more on the tech, the tech side, obviously, because everyone that we're having the virtual meeting with we first have to make sure they know how to get into that virtual meeting, things like that, that six months ago wasn't really a concern. But at a high level, I guess my routine is more or less the same. Uh, at work, on the personal side, I've not gone to the gym in over a month, which I think most people are the same way. So I, I've had to be more creative and my wife has stepped up to push me to be better about sticking with the workout routine. So that's definitely been a change personally. Yeah. So you're still, I think the key is, and I've heard this term over and over, it's not a snow day. And for those people that maybe their, their jobs, maybe they've been laid off or their jobs are not deemed essential and they're business owners, how important do you think it is to maintain physical fitness and, you know, eat right and follow the same routines you know, so you're not just wandering around the house in, in your sweatpants, even if you're not working right now, how important is that to maintain mental health? Oh, it's critical. I think everyone needs some sense of uh, organization and structure and things to do in their life. 
and uh, and and I imagine that for those people that don't have the the day to day stuff that I have, it's probably been a challenge. Uh, and for them, I guess I would just encourage them to figure out how do you dedicate time each day to a specific task and make sure you're staying on top of things. For me, what's great about my day to day is I'm accountable not only to myself but to my clients and my team members and my family. Uh, if you don't have that structure that I'm fortunate to have right now through it, how do you find ways to be accountable to yourself? And I know that that can be very challenging. So finding those routines and sticking with them, I imagine, is critical for, for everyone out there. Absolutely. Um, before we wrap up, I do have one more question that's been eking at me here. And so I'm, I'm curious, I'm always curious where people get their information because right now, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've, I've snoozed on Facebook. You can snooze people for 30 days and they're all people that, you know, we may see, uh, in, mm -hmm. in normal life, but, uh, because of the, uh, spread of information and not knowing mm -hmm. necessarily the truth or the, the source of that information, uh, it's important to be weeding that out for you as somebody that's tied, your, your career is very much tied to the economic side of what's going on in the, in the ripple of this, of this, this pandemic, where do you get your information? Where do you get your news? Like wh what sources have you turned off? What have you turned on? Things like that. Yeah. So I would say very little of my news information comes from social media. Uh, as far as the economy and markets and business, I tune in regularly to a number of strategists and economists on a weekly basis to just phone calls they put out. Uh, I listen to NPR NewsHour multiple times a day. On the coronavirus stuff, my wife is a medical professional, so she re hears about stuff and articles, her involvement with the county health department, so a lot of information comes from her and the reporting she hears about. So most of it is, I guess, the routine sources that I would get information from before everything went on. Uh, I don't know if that helps a ton, but uh, I try to get as unbiased and direct info as possible. Yep, yeah, that's key. And, and, and not that many people aren't doing that, but I think there is so much fear mongering that's happening on social media and it's a lot of it's speculative and I, especially with something like this i mean it's it's okay to have opinions but i think it's very mm -hmm. important maybe you'll agree with me that um it's so important that we're getting our our information from a place that is reputable and if that means turning off social media this could be a great opportunity for us to turn it off mm -hmm. uh, what what i would say is no one gets clicks or sells newspapers by saying everything's okay. So I think your point, the, the fear mongering, the, the excitement and all sorts of, the, the more dramatic things sound, uh, the more sens uh, sensationalized I'd say it is. And I, I try to avoid that, but it, I know that I have my own biases and sometimes everyone does. And so sometimes it's hard to turn those things off. Yeah, yeah, be kind you know, be supportive, get your news from a good place, take it as it is. And for you, you know, what kind of advice do you have for kind of your everyday person that's, you know, making money? Everybody has to make money to live, right? And what's kind of some general advice going forward as we wrap up here for people that are scared? Remember that this will pass and we'll get through it. Not that it'll be easy, but come up with a way to systematize and make a habit out of whatever the steps are that will get you to your goals. If you wanna retire someday, then make sure the automatic savings are happening through whatever your retirement plan is at work or set up automatic transfers from your bank. Uh, if you're somebody that doesn't really know what your goals are, then spend some time to think about what, you're, what you want to achieve, what you want to accomplish and write them down. And then talk to somebody to figure out how do you accomplish those. So by staying, I guess, level-headed and rational and, and think about 
what you can be doing to be in a better position down the road. Uh, those would be the things I would try to encourage people to do. Awesome. And stop buying toilet paper. Yeah, yeah. You know, fortunately, uh, Brina and I had a Costco pack of toilet paper going into all of this. So I guess you could call us preppers uh, since we were ready for it. But we did have to get uh, paper towels the other day. So we were lucky it was in stock. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because people were stocking up as if there was going to never be toilet paper ever again. Uh, when in reality, one of those Costco packs, kind of crazy. If you did the math on it, how many uh, poops you'd have to take a day for that to make sense? What I, I was on a call. It was fascinating talking about how the, the demand for it has been fascinating, I think, as everyone knows. But the supply chain was never impacted. There was never a shortage and commercial supplies of toilet paper. There are huge surpluses right now. When you think about like the toilet paper roll you have at home versus the one at the office, the big commercial roll, there's tons of that because no one's going to the restaurants or the office and using it. And so suppliers have way too much inventory of that and they're still making regular toilet paper, but people are just, Buying it all up. People want that three ply Charmin aloe vera toilet paper. So, but uh, thank you for the economic lesson on toilet paper and uh, the current surplus of commercial toilet paper. Addison, my brother from another mother, thank you so much for joining me on the Building Bellingham series. Uh, I learned a lot from you today. I'm sure everybody else did. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And uh, we are out. Thanks for having me. Take care.